Okay. This is what should be done by one who is skillness in goodness and who knows the, the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and non conceited, contented and easily satisfied not busy with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful, calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise will later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings they may be, whether they are strong, no, sorry, they are weak or strong, or meeting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those to be born and born and to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any any beings in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protect with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherry all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upward to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking or, or sitting or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should recollect this, recollect, one should recollect this, this is said to be a supply abiding by not holding to false views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, cool. Yes. Oh, I don't know. It's, uh, you see, my talk is, is very uncertain. Uh, sometimes it's a good talk. Uh, sometimes it's okay. Yeah, and sometimes it's just. Sure <laughs> sometimes sure it's just. Sometimes it's just um, almost no traction. No, or goes all over the place. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So today's talk, uh, um, I'll talk about basically the the mind state uh, of um, basically anger, frustration, and um, despair. Um, because um, the reason why I'm going to talk about it is because um, two weeks ago, about three weeks ago, I, I was invited to, do a, to go to an art gallery. So I went to an art gallery. And um, so one of the supporters told me, invited me to go and look at some Buddhist painting. I said, oh, OK, that would be interesting. Yeah? So myself and Venerable Sukhakamala from the Cambodian Temple. So myself and, um, and Venerable and two other laypersons went to a uh, Buddhist painting art gallery. I said, OK, it'll be interesting to look at some um, maybe old Buddhist painting. So when we arrived there, we, uh, it's about half, half an hour drive close to the suburb. Um, I think close to the Swan River. Um, I think in a hotel called um, Swan Hotel. And there was a Buddhist uh, gallery there. La. So I went there to have a look. Uh, and when I went there to have a look, uh, I, it's not what I really expected. La. 
because uh, there was an artist that was did some painting uh, during the COVID lockdown. Uh, so he painted uh, quite a lot of painting uh, for about one year uh, during the lockdown. Uh, and the artist was from Taiwan. Uh, so when I went there to have a look, uh, it was quite interesting uh, because the theme of the painting uh, was um, all the different hell, hell, hell Rome uh, and uh, all the people that's been um, tortured, hang up, cut alive, and when they die, uh, they get reborn again. Uh, then, uh, then the same thing ha happened again. Uh, so it, it gives a lot of different um, stages of hell uh, where people have been tortured uh, due to their karma. Uh, so the more I look at this, uh, it was quite interesting, uh, and it explained why they are in hell uh, and the uh, misconduct or the uh, evil karma they did. Uh. So I was looking at that, I go, hmm, this is pretty interesting. Uh, but I think in my heart, uh, I felt like this, is, this kind of um, teaching uh, will really put people off. Uh, because um, if, if we did talk, think, talk about this, if Buddhist monk talk about things like that, uh, um, it probably put a lot of new people off uh, because, it's, because sometimes life is hard enough uh, and we're going through a lot of difficulty. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is, is to understand why people are, are reborn in hell uh, and, and all the causing condition and that lead people there. Uh, that even the, um, there was a lady there that was guiding myself and my friend, uh, um, Venerable Sukhukama, along, uh, explaining um, what was happening uh, to all these different pictures. Uh, and um, she was saying she had to um, read about it, uh, study up. Uh, and so when she's doing the guide, yeah, she can explain to the people uh, what was happening. Uh, there was a few people there. Uh, so, um, and she told me that she was getting quite uh, anxious uh, when reading all these, all these things and, and um, working out why, why people are reborn in those uh, destinations. And um, those, so basically, I just told her very simply, uh, I say, look, if you are a good person, uh, you keep the five precepts, uh, um, then you definitely guarantee uh, that uh, your mind will not get reborn uh, into those destinations. Reason why people get reborn in those destinations uh, is basically they break the five precepts uh, quite often, uh, like things like killing, um, stealing, uh, adultery, uh, hard speech, lying, and just indulging in, in drugs and alcohol. Uh, Yep, because all those behaviors uh, will bring a person mentally down downwards. Uh, because um, I mean, I mean, before I was a Buddhist, uh, I used to um, smoke and drink and uh, also <laughs> try some drugs uh, and hang around um, um, friends that was um, just basically partying all the time. Uh, um, and my speech wasn't that gentle. Uh, it was a lot of rough speech uh, because I was working up in the mines. So when when I worked in the mines about 30 years ago, uh, um, people was basically a bit rough. Uh, 20, 30 years? No, about, about 20 years ago. Uh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the Buddha did say, uh, and you associate with, with the wise people, you learn and you, you mirror their behavior. Uh, but you associate with, with people that's basically not keeping the five precepts uh, and uh, basically um, quite competitive fooling around, uh, then you slowly become like, like the, the friends that you hang around. Uh, so uh, at that time, working up in the mines, basically I just hang around with rough, a lot of rough people. Uh, I was basically drinking a lot uh, and um, basically taking drugs. Uh, and, I, and I slowly got conditioned into that kind of behavior. Uh, and um, it actually made me, made my mind in a terrible state. Uh, so it's only that I, I decided that I cannot live like this for like one or two years, uh, I need to break the cycle. Uh. So then I, I came across Buddhism. Uh, and um, one thing that Buddhism taught uh, was basically um, our action, speech, and thoughts. Uh, um, it will follow us uh, no matter where we go, uh, this life and the next birth. Uh. So it's like the, um, the wheel of, of an ox cart uh, that our action and speech uh, and our mind state, uh, wherever we go, uh, that ox. That that's uh, our um, cart uh, will follow us. Uh, but if we do good things uh, by uh, body, speech, and mind, uh, then it's like the shadow that never leaves leave us. Uh, so no matter where we go, uh, 
our good karma will follow us. And also same with our bad karma. La. So as, as soon as I read that la, from the Dharma Pada, la, um, it made a lot of sense. I realized that, okay, I need to um, stop messing around la, with my friends la, when I was working up the mines. I was quite young at the time, in my 20s. La, and I decided to basically just practice Buddhism, meditation, la, and cultivate the mind. And um, basically um, change the way that I think and behave. Um, I didn't know much about meditation, but I was got very interested la, in med, med, uh, Buddhism uh, first, uh, then meditation later. Uh. So one thing that I I did a lot of study uh, is is cause and cause and effect. Uh. And one thing that they encourage uh, um, to do is is to um, practice metta uh, or loving kindness. So what we we ch we chanted just now, uh, the metta sutta. Uh, basically, that's that is almost the the guideline instruction. Uh, how we should we should behave uh, towards ourselves and other people, because um, when you do that, uh, it brings a lot of happiness and joy uh, and lightness, lightness to one's heart. Uh. And when that happens, uh, things like um, anger, discontent, frustration, rage, um, things like that, it basically it, it slowly um, become less and less, because to the extreme case uh, is. Um, I gave a talk, um, maybe in my last two talks, uh, um, about sometimes going to the, to the prison, and sometimes you meet prisoners are there uh, that have done um, crimes, uh, and they are associating with people uh, that's in for for crimes that they did, uh, and when you're in those company, uh, you become almost career criminals, uh, and uh, sometimes when people are released uh, after they they serve the time. Uh, those kind of um, uh, conditioning uh, does linger, linger on the mind. Uh, and um, so I, I was saying when, when I was staying in Melbourne, uh, support, supporting my, one of my friends uh, and setting up, help setting up a monastery, uh, um, someone just came over after two hours of driving and he was telling me that, oh, he's just having a very difficult problem uh, at home. Uh, a lot of rage and anger come up uh, in, in his daily life. Uh, so I asked him what's happening, yeah? and he told me that he, we went to prison for a few years. And he, when he got out of prison, yeah? um, he's, he's, he's finding it very hard to deal with um, his emotion yeah? and his memory, yeah? and was causing his, his partner a lot of hard, hardship. Yeah? So at that time, I was, I was quite busy, and he just came over yeah? after like two hours driving, yeah? asking for advice. Yeah? And for a Buddhist monk, uh, I find that, oh, okay, I'm a bit busy at the, at the time, uh, helping to set up a monastery. Uh. What can I do? Uh? So I, I remember a simile uh, of a pot. So I, I told this person, uh, the pot is like a, a vessel of water. And when the vessel of water is, is neutral, when you put a lot of um, salt in, uh, it becomes salty. The more salt you put in, uh, the more salty it becomes. So that's, that's, that's how the mind works. When we put a lot of salt in, uh, after a while, uh, the water will taste ex extremely salty uh, th to the point where you can't really drink it. Uh. But according to Buddhism, uh, if we develop wholesome qualities uh, and let go of the unwholesome uh, memories and emotions and thoughts, uh, it's like adding uh, fresh water into the pot. The more we add uh, fresh water into the pot, uh, then the um, saltiness will, will dilute more and more and more uh, until later on uh, um, you don't get the taste of the saltiness in the pot. Uh, so the mind will naturally purify it. Uh. So once you purify it, uh, all those past memories, thought and anger and rage uh, will disappear. Uh, and it is overcome by loving kindness uh, and letting go uh, and compassion and forgiveness, uh, especially to oneself. Uh. So uh, I gave that s small advice, then he left and I turned to basically just do more study on the internet, a lot of Buddhist information. And I think about maybe two weeks or a month time he came back. He came back about twice. So every time he came back, I noticed he became more relaxed and more happier. So that's one of the extreme cases I, I noticed uh, with people that are in very difficult situation, especially if they are done something um, not skillful in life and um, basically end up in, in, in the prison system. Um, it's quite interesting yeah, because um, sometimes we joke around, we say Bodhiyana Monastery yeah, is also a prison and um, a lot of the monks here yeah, are doing time. <laughs> yeah. 
So because we have a wall here and the monks are stuck here for a few years, they're not allowed to leave until they finish the training after five years. And so one year is a um, training as a lay person in white, we call it Anagarika. Then, um, then you, after one year, you ordain as a, um, a, a novice monk. After, one, after another year as a novice monk, then you ordain as, as a fully monastic, a fully ordained pikula. And after five years, so total seven years, then you can basically move around and travel around different monastery yeah, and support the different branch monastery. Yep. So, um, so sometimes we can see this as a prison, <laughs> the monastery here. Yeah. But, um, but further up the hill, about uh, five or eight kilometers from the monastery, yeah, there is a canard prison farm. And um, a lot of the monks uh, um, do go and visit there uh, and, and teach every Friday night. Yeah. But due to the um, restriction with the government, uh, due to COVID, uh, the monks are not going there yet. Uh, so maybe once the uh, restrictions are lifted, uh, and then the monks will go back to the prison system to do some teaching in, um, at Friday night yeah, for one and a half hours. Uh, um, yeah, so what the prison officer have told us uh, that you see when the monks uh, go up there and teach, uh, the prisoners are more better behaved are more, and more relaxed uh, and a lot more happier. Uh, and sometimes when they get released from the prison system, uh, they, they normally go back to normal life and they don't re-offend. So, um, so Buddhist monks do have some kind of um, conditioning or brainwashing up there. <laughs> so yeah, so it's quite interesting. And a lot of the prisoners, they do come over to the monastery and help with some chores and work. And basically we just treat them like normal human beings. And they, they tend to mingle with, with, with the normal people, the normal crowd for lunch. And, um, they're well respected. So the Buddhist community do take care of the prisoners that come to the monastery. Um, there is always a prison guard around just to, um, to supervise the prisoners while they're, they're doing work or coming for lunch in the monastery. And the prisoners, they like coming to the monastery because they say the food is really delicious. And um, they, they treat it with kindness and respect and not looked down as, as prisoners. So all human beings, we all urge that respect le, for one another le. and sometimes it's no, no point putting down people or shaming people le. because when we shame and put people down, they won't learn yeah, and the opposite will happen. So um, yeah, so that's one thing I realized uh, when I was working up, up in the mines, uh, it was quite a macho environment. Uh, there was a lot of very competitive and a lot of um, putting down. Uh, so. <laughs> You have to basically stand your ground and um, be, be tougher than the next guy. Yeah. So um, I did, did not want to um, go, like, live in that kind of mind state. Yeah. So that's why I, I chose to be by myself and st study more meditation and more Buddhist practice. But one thing I did study a lot was um, the, the metta, yeah, loving kindness teaching. Yeah. And that really helped me a lot. Yeah to basically lessen my, um, my anger la, and my, my depression in my heart. La. There are a lot of benefits when you practice loving kindness. La. So, um, so let me share with you la, the benefit. Because yep. I can't remember everything. Yeah? So sometimes I have a little note. La. Okay, so the Buddha say, yeah, um, there's 11 benefits of loving kindness. Uh, one is when you practice loving kindness by body, speech, and mind, um, you will sleep well. So uh, you sleep easily. Uh, you, number, then number second thing is you wake up very uh, comfortably or peacefully. Yeah? Um, you have nice dreams. Yep, that's true. And one time well, I realized when I practice met loving kindness a lot, la, I do sleep well, and I wake up well, and I have nice dreams. Sometimes I dream of flying through the air, or floating through the air. Things like um, nightmares and stuff basically disappear. Um, then you become dear to a human being. So sometimes if you're kind and gentle. You tend to make a lot of friends. So when I was in the mine, when I started practicing meditation, loving kindness and meditation, I found I got more friends and people tend to trust me more. And when they go out to the party, I go with them, but I will not drink. 
and I'll just take care of my friends that are driving back home one by one uh, to make sure they're nice and safe uh, back home. Um, then um, a person becomes dear to, to non-human beings, uh, that basically animals, um, also unseen beings too. Uh, so it's also attracted uh, to uh, people that's kind. Uh, so what I mean by unseen beings is you might have spirits uh, around the place and if they can pick up that energy, uh, if you have a, a, a heart of metal, uh, because um, that energy, animals also can pick that up. Uh, because when we first moved to Newbury Buddhist Monastery yeah, in the early days, I noticed the kangaroos will run away as soon as they see a human being. Yeah. Same with the wombats and the birds. Yeah. But after five years there, when we walk, walk around the monastery, yeah, the kangaroos just look at us um, walking past. Same with the wombats and the birds. Yeah. The birds will fly in, yeah. fly close by asking for food. Yeah. So yes, so animals do pick up. Yeah on um, um, the kindness uh, and none harm uh, and I think also snakes uh, because one time I was walking with one of the um, um, shy inspectors uh, and she was saying about the what need to be done to um, improve our sewage system uh, um, and inspecting some of the work and she did ask me uh, is there any snakes in the in the monastery uh, and I, I looked down and I say I pointed straight down uh, just about uh, one meter away from me, I say, look, there's a snake down there. And she looked down, she got really, <laughs> really frightened. I say, no, it's okay. I say, um, if you have good intention, the, the animal will pick up. Yep. So you see, they, they don't, they don't um, bite or, or get afraid of, of human beings. But I don't think she, she buy by what I say. <laughs> yes. And one of the, um, the, the sixth um, factor is also devas or gods uh, or heavenly beings uh, um, also protect that the person with loving kindness. Uh, um, hmm, that might be interesting. Sometimes you say, is that true? Sometimes I wonder, is that true too? But stay in the monastery for so long. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things that happen uh, in the monastery. Uh, I mean, the more I stay here, the longer I speak to lay people, guests that stays here, and sometimes the feedback is quite interesting, yeah? especially in the monastery, yeah? because sometimes we have guests and also other monastic. Um, for monks, we can't talk about our practice, but, I, but there's a loophole. Yeah? So other guests, they stay here, and some of them have good meditation, some of them have average meditation, yeah? and sometimes they ask myself or other monks, yeah? they say at night they go for a walk, or they go in the forest and sometimes they notice really bright um, orbs or lights moving in the forest. And they ask me, is it a four drive or someone with a flashlight here? And I ask him to describe it. And sometimes they describe it's like a bright light moving, like something like a, a ball. And I ask how bright is it? And they say it's really bright sometimes. I say, okay, those are, you see, um, heavenly beings here. And you see in the monastery, they do come and visit la, and check out the monastery, especially in the opposite day night, yeah, the full moon night. Uh, they are rare, um, but we have guests that ex exported them before la, in the monastery. Yeah. Yep. So, um, hmm. so when you stay in the monastery, there's quite a lot of interesting things. Uh, but you see, we tell the guests, just keep it quiet and don't really talk about it too much. Uh, because uh, if they talk about it too much, uh, then um, people might be, think that they they're a bit crazy in the head. La. <laughs> but as Buddhist monk, we believe this um, basically just cause and effect. La. If people practice well in this life la, and they have a pure heart, la, you see the next life they get reborn in a good destination. La. And if they get reborn in a good destination, la, then generally they'll continue practicing as a, as, as, as a, as a uh, Buddhist practitioner. La. So one of the seven conditions is um, a person that practices loving kindness, uh, fire, poison, and weapons. Weapon does not harm that, that being. I don't know about fire um, weapons, uh, but with poison, I believe that is possible. Uh, because one thing I noticed, if you have a lot of loving kindness and um, you get sick, like food poisoning and stuff, uh, um, you tend to recover quite rapidly. Uh, 
and um, the, the monks to teach uh, meditation at the Armadale Meditation Group that's next to the hospital and a lot of the doctors recommend the uh, patient to come over uh, for the guided meditation and what we notice people that uh, attend the class uh, they tend to recover and heal more rapidly uh, com compared to the normal patient that don't come for the class uh. And um, we also know of some people that the doctors say that they only have like maybe a few months or a year to live. Uh, and they've been practicing meditation for like quite a long time. Uh, and these people, um, some of them are they're still alive for like after 10, 8 years uh, and still doing well. Uh. So the mind do have a, a um, quite a powerful effect over the body. Uh. So sometimes instead of having we fear, worry, anxiety, uh, uh, we, we, develop, we, we develop acceptance uh, and kindness towards this body. So when you do that, uh, it allows the body to heal very, very well and rapidly. Uh. Because when I was up in the mines um, with a lot of anger and rage, uh, one thing I noticed, think, one thing that happened is um, I get headaches, then my hand shakes a bit, then I get ring, ringing, uh, and my vision become a bit blurry. Uh, and um, yeah, and I, was, I got quite sickly after a while then when I was quite depressed. But when I start doing loving, loving kindness meditation and meditation combined together, um, then I, I noticed my, my eyesight, my hearing and my shakiness and my headache all went away. And, um, and my health improved a lot. So I, I realized I become more relaxed and more at ease. So it allows the body to basically um, regenerate la, and heal itself la, naturally yeah. because in this um, society yeah, people are just overworked, stressed and too anxious la, and that brings out a lot of um, tension within this body yeah. so when you can relax la, then the, the, the body tends to heal itself more rapidly yeah. and we, if we sleep well then that, that repair, repair the body a lot faster la. Because when I was up in the mines, uh, sometimes I would not sleep for like one week or two weeks. Uh, so my health was really going down rapidly uh, because there was just too much anxiety uh, and wondering thoughts in my mind. Yep. So yeah, so that's the only thing I can think of. Poison, fire and weapons that's a harm a person. It's definitely poison, that, that is true. Uh. Um, his mind be become concentrated quickly uh, and that's quite, tr that, that's quite true uh, because people that practice loving kindness uh, they tend to have the best meditation because the mind becomes calm and peaceful quite rapidly uh, and they can develop um, metta nimitta uh, so what nimitta is is, is is the sign of the mind so when a person goes into um, deep samadhi uh, the five senses shut down and what you see is, is a um, radiant, bright mind. So um, one thing I noticed, I've been teaching meditation for like a few, few years now, and I noticed people that practice loving kindness, uh, they tend to have one of the best meditation uh, because um, they have a very joyful heart uh, and very kind, pure heart. Uh, and when, when a practitioner go into um, samadhi, uh, they tend to have a, a very bright, radiant mind. Uh, and that's why I believe then when people that have a lot strong loving kindness uh, so once they pass away and get reborn in the next next rebirth uh, the, the chance of getting reborn in a higher higher plane is is, is the chance is a way higher uh, than someone that don't practice loving kindness because when you're kind and gentle uh, and forgiving uh, then um, your mind would love, roughly incline that direction mm -hmm. and um, well, the ninth condition is um, his um, face and complexion become more serene, so um, it become more relaxed. So one thing I notice when people are staying in the monastery, as they become more calm and more peaceful and more relaxed, you can see their face become more smooth. Because I notice with um, our lay guests that come here and stay for the three, three months range retreat, they come back, their face is a bit tired, a bit wrinkly yeah? and it, they look a bit worn out yeah? but after three months yeah, staying in the monastery practicing yeah, when they're about to leave the monastery I notice um, they look a lot younger yeah, and a lot more happier yeah? 
and more radiant. Uh, they are more have a radiant face. Uh. <laughs> yes, and um, and one when he dies, uh, the tenth condition. When a person dies, uh, he's not confused. Uh. So um, yeah, so a person that practices a lot of loving kindness. When a person passes away, uh, is, he does not pass away with a mind that is confused uh, and afraid, uh, because uh, the person is more at ease and more relaxed. Uh. So when Buddhist monk, when we go and see our old Buddhist practitioner in nursing homes or in, uh, uh, they, I think they call parental care, uh, when they have um, the last, the last stages in their life. Uh, I noticed one time I went to see this old striking lady and she was in the 80s and she was dying uh, from old age and sickness. Uh, and every time we, we go and visit her, uh, she always looked radiant and happy uh, and quite sharp in her mind. Uh, I was very happy uh, to see the monks. Uh, so we give a, give a blessing, then we go back, then she, she end up leaving. Then we, we did it about three or four times uh, before she passed away. Uh, and, um, and I noticed she was always very quite radiant and sharp in her mind. Uh, and, but everyone else in the nursing home uh, seems very lost and confused uh, and a lot of fear and worry in their face. Uh. Yep. So yeah, so when you practice loving kindness, uh, you, you tend to um, pass away more peacefully with um, calmness and wisdom. And the, the last factor uh, or benefit uh, is when a person gets reborn, uh, um, sometimes if he don't become enlightened, uh, then there's a chance that he might be, get reborn in the Brahma world. Uh, so that's a higher world where you see the um, people are reborn in, in the day, day David Rome, Rome, sir. Yeah. So these are the 11 benefits of practicing loving kindness. Okay, so um, I think we'll start the, the garden meditation because I think I dragged on a bit too long <laughs> already. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so we, we, I go through a loving kindness garden meditation. Okay, so please sit comfortably. Gently close your eye and take three big breaths. Breathe in and breathe out. Yep, and gently bring your awareness to your face. It's always very important just to learn to relax this body especially after a hard day of work so we start up with our body scanning first from the top of our head relax be kind to our face make peace with our face and kindly physically Relax our face. Relax with kindness and peace. Relax. Now, we gently, kindly bring our awareness to our neck. Relax our neck with kindness and peace. Now we gently bring our awareness to our upper body. Relax our shoulder. Relax with kindness and peace. Now we gently bring our awareness to our arms, both our arms. Make sure is quite relaxed and rested. Kindly move it around. Not too tense, nice and relaxed. And kindly let go and relax 
our arms. Now we gently bring our awareness to our hands and we kindly, gently relax our hands, our fingers, relax with kindness and peace. Now, gently, we bring our awareness to our upper back. It should be nice and straight, not too rigid. Rest it comfortably and we kindly relax our back with kindness and peace. Now, mindfully, we bring our awareness from our back slowly, gently downwards to our lower back where it's sitting on the cushion. Please gently move it around, make it comfortable and we relax with kindness and peace. Let we make peace with our back. Now, gently bring our awareness to both our legs. If we need to move it around gently, kindly, Make it comfortable and we relax with, can with kindness and peace, relax our legs. Mm. Now we gently Bring our awareness down to our feet, both our feet. If you need to move it around, please do so. Then we kindly, gently relax our feet, our soul, our toes. Relax with kindness and peace. Now, we gently, slowly bring our awareness from our feet to our legs, to our tummy. Make sure our tummy is nice and loose. Our clothes are not too tight. And we kindly, gently relax our tummy with peace and kindness. Now, we gently bring our awareness up to our chest and we kindly, gently relax our chest with peace, with kindness, with peace and letting go. Relax and breathe in, breathe in peace, breathe out. Calm. 
breathing kindness without letting go. Breathe in peace without kindness. Breathe naturally. Our heart is the feeling part. We feel calm, peace, kindness, relax, and letting go. Our heart is the feeling part, and our mind is the thinking. We think of kind things, and our heart we feel the warmth and the kindness. We generate peace and happiness with our thought and our feeling. As our body becomes calmly, kindly relaxed, we bring our awareness to our breathing. Breathing gently and breathing out calmly. As we become relaxed and our breath become calm and peaceful, then we can start the guided loving kindness meditation. We always start from within our heart and mind by saying, may I be happy and well. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from mental and physical suffering. May I abide in happiness and joy. May I forgive myself for any wrongdoing by body, speech and mind. May I be happy and well. May I abide in happiness, peace, calm, kindness, and freedom from suffering and pain. We use the words and feeling just to calm the mind, calm our heart.
Now, when you have love, loving kindness within your heart, then you can share it outwards. May my parents, my mom, my dad, my brother and sisters, my dear family members, may they be happy and well. May they be free from anxiety, worry, pain. May they be happy and well. May my friends be happy and well. Free for mental and physical pain. May they abide in happiness and peace. So gently bring awareness back to your body and just relax your body, relax more. Make peace with any tension or pain within this, within this body, with kindness, gentleness. Gently bring your awareness back to your breathing.
if you feel any sensation from the body, any warmth or tension within this body, just gently, kindly, just relax, make peace with this body. with kindness and letting go. As we become more calm and peaceful, then you find your awareness of the body tends to increase. It's okay. We just calmly, gently, kindly relax and allow our body or the energy to arise and slowly disappear through letting go and kindness kindness towards this body as is in pain or, or tired we make peace with this body. We are kind to the pain. And we let it go with kindness. And we gently bring our awareness back to our breath. Just breathing in peace and letting go. With kindness.
when everything becomes calm and peaceful, we delight in peace. We delight in peace. We delight in joy of a peaceful mind. We delight in letting go. We delight in calmness and peace of mind. So please enjoy the next few minutes of calm, peace and freedom. And peace of mind.
Okay, so we'll finish the meditation soon. After <clears throat> the tree ringing out the bell, gently, calmly, kindly come out meditation. So when you come up meditation, always come up gently and then just sit down quietly and try not to move around too much eh? and just continue to enjoy the, um, the calmness and peace. Eh? Mm. So one thing I find with um, loving kindness, eh? if, if I work too hard or I get in an argument with someone in the monastery uh, then um, if I go back uh, and carry that um, argument or hurt uh, then find that meditation is not getting anywhere uh, it's not getting peaceful uh, then, uh, then sometimes you learn to uh, forgive people for who they are uh, but most important thing is forgive myself uh, because um, we are human beings and uh, we, we are trying our best uh, and you see we give a benefit or a doubt to people eh? because regardless if it's a monastic or a lay person we all make mistakes eh? so um, loving kindness is learning to forgive oneself and other people eh? for our mistake eh? so when we forgive other people eh? and we forgive ourselves eh? then we become free we don't carry things in our heart eh? Because if we carry things, the hurt in our heart, then basically it's, it's like the Buddhists say, it's like carrying a hot coal in our hand. We carry it, it burns our hand. And if we try and throw it at someone, um, basically it might miss, they might not get, get um, hit. So it's like picking out a hot coal. You pick it out, you get burned, and you try and throw it at someone. So, there's no benefit uh, to um, holding out anger. The Buddha say anger is like a sickness of mind. Uh, the mind is defiled. Uh. So if we develop loving kindness, uh, then we find that we become more happier, more relaxed. Uh, then um, we don't have a bad mind state. And when it's practiced well, uh, then we live a life of peace, happiness, and what other people do uh, is their karma and they are, is their business. Uh. But what we, we can do uh, is take care of our own body, speech and mind uh, and um, create the loving kindness and the forgiveness uh, to all beings. Uh. Then later on, uh, people will become more, um, what's the word, uh, more friendly and also trust will build up. Uh. Because we all know that we see someone that's always angry and frustrated. Le. We just want to keep away from people that are, all what they, we say like, mentally um, unstable le, with defilements. Le. And we all like to hang around with, with nice, calm, kind people. Le. Yep. But at the end of the day, le, you get those 11 benefits le, where you sleep well, you wake up well, you have nice dreams of flying and um, sometimes you, you, you can dream of um, in Samadhi yeah? so there are some monks in the monastery if they have a lot of loving kindness and when they sleep they sleep with a very peaceful mind then they dream that they're meditating yeah? and when they wake up yeah? sometimes they wake up with a bright radiant mind yeah? So it becomes like um, the meditation is a part of the dream. Yep. So instead of seeing that meditating calm the mind, it just become automatic in the dream. Because the mind is pure. 
So meditation, loving kindness is to purify the mind. The more we purify the mind, the more happy and more free we can become. So if you ever find that your meditation is not getting any traction, apply a, a bit of loving kindness. Uh, then things will settle down pretty rapidly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, is there any questions? So this is a very nice opportunity if you have a question about the talk or if you wish to share some experiences or ask about your experiences with your meditation. It's a very good chance. This will be my last talk. Eh? And um, on Monday I'm flying to uh, Victoria. So hopefully the, the rest restriction will lift. And if it leaves, leave first, then I'll fly over to Victoria and uh, basically do some work and do some teaching there. But if, if the restriction is there, even better. So I'll go, I'll go on quarantine for um, two weeks. Uh, so it's basically a, a two weeks retreat. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I quite like when this um and when there's restrictions. Uh, so flying coming back here from Victoria last time, uh, I had to go for quarantine for two weeks. Uh, so it was a nice quiet time uh, to do a two weeks retreat. Uh. So if the quarantine is still there, uh, then I'll fly over to Victoria uh, and go for another two weeks uh, retreat. Uh, yeah, by myself. Sounds wonderful, Ajahn. We have some questions in the chat here for you. Yes. Uh, from Jim in Germany. He would like, he's just curious, mm -hmm. but he would like to know whether you went directly from working in the mines to monastic life. Or did you have a break after leaving the mines before deciding what you wanted to do in the next life? Okay. Um, I mean, okay. I, I was basically would say very desperate at the time. Um, yeah, I, I realized that my lifestyle wasn't helping me because um, it felt great to um, party and, and mess around with my friends. Uh, but when I go back to my room, my mind was a mess. Uh, and it was, it was like, almost like addiction, constantly um, feeding the mind with, with um, substance abuse, uh, drinking, smoking, uh, and trying other illegal drugs. Uh, it's not recommended, but once, once I became a Buddhist monk, then, uh, no, sorry, once I became a Buddhist, uh, I, 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 I stopped all that. Uh, yep. Yes. So when I stopped all that, uh, then I found I was happy uh, because um, I didn't need all this substance to make me happy, but I found happiness was in my heart, uh, not, not out in the world uh, or take things, uh, or feeling the senses. And after that, I went to um, went to Bodhiyana Monastery when when I took my leave, and um, did more religious study and meditation. And I told myself, okay, I'm, I really want to become a monastic and really try this full time. And my parents say no, so I say, okay, I'll wait for ten years. So I was still working in the mines for eight years, but every time. Um, I took leave, I'll go and stay in the monastery for one to two months. No, sorry, two weeks to one month and continue practicing my meditation and learning about Buddhism. So I did it, did it for 10 years and then I asked my parents if I can ordain and they say no. And I say when? They say another 10 years. I say after 10, after 10 years can I ordain? And they say no, of course not. I say wow, okay, lucky I asked. After another 10 years, I got ordained. And so I went ahead and ordained. But before that, I worked in the mines for eight years, then started my own business for two years, two, roughly about, about two years, less than two years. Then I worked um, paying off my debt for eight months. Then I went and um, joined the monastery. Yeah. That was 11 years ago. Mm. Yep. Um, uh, thank you, Ajahn. We have a uh, Kathy would like to ask you a question as well. Kathy, yes. are you ready? Oh, yes, I am. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for that You're beautiful um, you know, meditation and everything. I've absolutely found so much benefit in it. And I was just wondering, like, if someone 
from your past and mis has totally misunderstood you mm -hmm. and holds a lot of like bitterness mm -hmm. and ill will for you mm -hmm. and and does extremely harmful acts towards your body and your mind and your soul and like they just want to sort of negate everything about you mm -hmm. and I was just wondering what sort of attitude as a, from a Buddhist perspective should you have towards that person and that being and should you like you know um, send the loving kindness to sort of stop the anger and holding the, the anger in your hand with like the coal in your hand burning your hand mm. through you know um, I'm just trying to work it out in myself. Okay. Um, it is very difficult. Eh? So if you're in mm. some kind of um, relationship or partnership, eh? either at home or at work, eh? um, there is always, um, we we'll say, abusive and controlling people. Eh? So especially if they're not Buddhists, they don't give the precept. Eh? Um, they, they can be quite manip manipulating yeah? and use a lot of int intimidation. Yeah? So it does happen a lot yeah? in the workplace and also at home. Yeah? And when that happens, yeah? sometimes the best thing to do is set boundaries. And if that does not work, yeah? then sometimes it's best to um, not to react. Yeah? Because sometimes I find that um, um, in, in monasteries, um, sometimes it can get quite intense uh, with um, new monks that first ordained. They can um, be quite um, wild with the farmers. Uh, and once that happens, uh, sometimes we, we have to learn to um, be very patient and just be quite forgiving. Uh. So in the monastery, it's a bit easier because we know that people are still running through carrying their lot of baggage. Yeah? Um, so with, with monastic, it's not too bad. Yeah? But sometimes with lay people, they come and stay in the monastery. Yeah? Um, when things go wrong, yeah? um, sometimes they result to the, the old conditioning. So there was a lay person that I was um, taking care of. So I was sometimes, my role is a guest monk. So I take care of guests in the monastery. And when there's an um, argument in the monastery with another guest, and um, sometimes um, they don't like um, to be told what to do. And, but in the monastery, there are precepts to be kept. And we all have to work. And, um, and one of my job is make sure that the guests are working safely in the kitchen or in the workshop. And sometimes um, if I ask them not to um, use their equipment or to wear safety equipment, if possible, if they're using a chainsaw or using some, some dangerous tool. And um, they might feel like I'm trying to tell them off. But my intention was always just to make sure that they work in a safe environment. Because of my training up the mines, I was a um, safety um, rep. So I know quite a bit on safety. So if I see any guests that stay in the monastery that's using dangerous equipment, that might harm themselves other people. And you see, I have to like basically just tell them uh, not to do it, or maybe tell them off uh, not to use the, mach the machine. Uh, it might be too dangerous uh, because the monastery can be liable uh, if they hurt themselves. Uh, and we, get, we may get sued uh, by the family members. Uh, and sometimes, by being a bit too direct, uh, um, the, the guests might explode uh, in rage uh, and um, start screaming and shouting. Uh, and when that happens, uh, um, I just have to um, explain, no, this is, this is not on and safety is very important. And sometimes he, he might start pointing finger at me and say, you are the problem, you are, you are controlling me and, and start screaming and shouting. But I always maintain calmness and explain why not to um, continue working in a very unsafe environment. Yep. So it is very difficult when, when you're dealing with people that has got um, a lot of rage and anger. Le. And sometimes the next day, yeah, I'll just be nice to that person. Le. And uh, after a few days, it's, it's, it's go back to normal. Then later on, I found that it came from a very abusive um, 
family. Yeah? And his, his dad was uh, basically abusing him uh, when he was a child. Uh, so it, it brought a lot of his conditioning. So when I, in the monastery, I tell this guest not to use this machine or stop using it because it's not safe. You should not do things like that. Uh, you might harm yourself and hurt other people. Uh, so it, that tend to tr trigger his, um, his hurt uh, from his childhood. Uh, yep. So then he be becomes very um, aggressive. Uh, so as soon as I see that happening, I have to stop and just calmly let him basically vent his, his anger, his frustration. It's difficult, but sometimes you have to just almost bite your tongue and just, just let him vent it out. Let's just calmly explain to him. Because sometimes I find that if, if I treat him as a friend, with respect, you see they do change slowly, slowly change. So, so um, yeah, so sometimes I, I, I don't understand why some people are so aggressive, uh, but later on when, when, when he becomes relaxed and open up, uh, then I found from his background, uh, he, he got a really bad background uh, of a lot of abusive behavior by, by his family members and partners. Uh, then there's then basically a lot of compassion arise in my heart. Uh, Yep. So uh, I still in contact with with that guest, and sometimes I will basically ask ask him when are you coming back, uh, come back the monastic, we miss you uh, Come and help out in the monastery. Yeah. yeah. So he does have his moment, but he knows that in the monastery is is well protected, it's quite safe, uh, and the monks are, are quite forgiving. Yeah. yeah. Because um, sometimes it's harder uh, when. When, when, you, when you shout it and scream at it. And that's why the meditation is very important. So when you calm your mind down and develop loving kindness, then you realize everyone in the world is suffering. We all grow old, we all get sick, and we all die. So you, sometimes you have to reflect. Every being that we see through our eyes will get old, will get sick, and they will die. Yep. But the most important thing is we always have to learn to give for forgiveness. So when we forgive someone uh, and we respect someone, uh, they will grow. But if we want to um, tell them off or, bl or blame them or punish them, uh, they won't learn anything. Uh. So it is very hard. It's not, it's not, it is not um, easy. <laughs> because I think my, my, um, my, my, my experience up in the minds, uh, when you have so many men living together, uh, uh, it can be quite aggressive. Uh. So, so when I start learning meditation, I learn to let go of that hurt. Uh. I don't carry it on, uh, so I don't become another victim. Uh. Yep. So it's very, it's not easy. It's very difficult. Uh. But you just have to keep on learning to let go uh, and forgive. Uh. And uh, please set boundaries if you can. Yep. Because we, we are not, we're not a doormat. Uh. And if things get out of hand, set boundaries and basically just walk away. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you, Ajahn. And I think that also what you've just said also answers a point that uh, Rachel was just put in the chat, which is at what point does someone leave an abusive relationship instead of sending love and kindness and putting up with it? Because there is mm -hmm. considerable domestic. Uh, Violence in our society, can't Yes, yes, it's, it's getting more and more common because there's more, more and more people in the world, and people are basically um, getting brainwashed by the um, the media, by um, society, and other people. I mean, I I thought it wasn't that bad, but sometimes when I look into um, documentary. Why people do things like that? Le? Because sometimes I look at other monastic eh, in other tradition eh, that's doing all these abuses behavior. Le? And I was going, geez, these are monastic. Eh? They should have a very high standard. But basically, some of them are out of control. Le? Just doing really crazy stuff, le? like abusing people. Le? And what they do is just, they just move those monastic from place to place. Eh? And the abuse continues. Le? Oh, I mean, I'm so glad for, um, for the Buddhist precept. We have 227 rules 
And one of the rules is uh, a Buddhist monk should not be alone with another lady of the gender, regardless how old they are. Yep. So for Buddhist monk, if there's a lady or a child, there must be another man around. Eh? So that way there's three people. Eh? Because when there's only two people, eh, then all kind of abusive behavior may happen. Eh? Yeah, it's something very difficult and it's becoming more of a problem eh, these days. Eh? So um, what can we do? Eh? That's why for monastic, eh, it's very important for them to stay in a good monastery. Then you have other monastic around and um, a monastic should not be associating too much with lay people because um, if they associate too much with lay people, then the defilements can, can, can arise in the mind, especially with the officer gender. Yeah, that's why monks, we spend a lot of time alone in the forest, just practicing and meditating and understanding the defilements in our mind. And for most Buddhist monks, we should not go out teacher until we have 10 years in robe. So once we have 10 years in robe, then we can teach and uh, basically help to run and sell other monastery. Yeah. But before that, la, you continue to practice la, in solitude, la, alone. La. So the, the monks here, you see we spend uh, maybe one hour to four hours with, with a group, but most of the time we're just alone, la, practicing. Yeah. So that way we burn out the defilements. La. Yep. Because I, I do admit, the sexual desire la, is one of the strongest defilements uh, for a human being. Yeah. I mean, even myself, uh, I find it was very difficult uh, to let go of those uh, desires. Uh, but the more I can say celibate, uh, the more I let go, uh, then the more free I became. Uh, but for some monastic, uh, it is very hard for them to let go, uh, especially if the samadhi is not doing well. Uh. So, um, yeah, so this kind of abuse do happen, uh, and it's bec become very common. Jeez. Uh. <laughs> oh, what, what? Yeah, so the most difficult, most complicated problem in society. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, John, uh, we have just one more point. Could you tell us a little bit about Newbury Monastery? Okay. Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, Arjun Brown is asking for donations of bricks or money to build a monastery. Could you tell us something about this project? Okay, it's a so, totally different topic. I'm okay, sorry. no, no, no worries. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. So Newbury Buddhist Monastery is a new monastery. And um, it was established in 2014 um, in September. So um, I went there to support my friend uh, that was a head monk. Uh, so he was there, he was basically just overworked and he burned out. Uh, and he resigned uh, after one and a half years running the monastery. So uh, he basically gave it up to me uh, to, take care of the, to, to take care of the joint. Uh. And I told myself, geez, this is, this is going to basically almost, um, I think my practice is going downhill. <laughs> so, um, but luckily I, I told myself, um, I'm still quite a junior monk. At that time, I only got four reigns. Uh. I came over there to support my friend because he was struggling a bit uh, and over, overworked and burning out a bit. But, um, but Ajahn did tell me, Ajahn Brown did tell me that if I need to, I come back. Uh, and um, just do more practice here. So every um, six months, I'll come back to the monastery, yeah, Bodhiyana here, and, um, and just, just let go of um, um, baggages that I carry, yeah, uh, working, work, supporting the monastery over there. But luckily, Ajahn Brahm say we can have more monks there. Yeah. So we, we've been sending more monks yeah, from Bodhiyana over there just to support that community because that is a mixed community. Yeah of monks, nuns, and lay people. So we have one property uh, divided into um, three sections. So you have one section for monks, one section for nuns, and this year we're building one section uh, for uh, lay people. Uh. But in the beginning, uh, uh, it was an old motel uh, and, a, and a film set uh, where they, they film like, um, like the man from Snowy River uh, and a couple of different movies and TV series. So. Um, but because it, it was a uh, old motel, la, so we're not restricted by how many people we can have in the monastery. Yeah. So at the moment, the plan is to have about 80 plus um, monastic and also lay people la, in the same property. Yeah. Because it's zoned as, as a motel, la, so we can really establish that place. Yeah. So, um, so my friend, the head monk, da, he, it was a really good idea that he um, looked into um, 
acquiring that property. So he looked over 100 properties in Victoria and found that was the ideal location. But, um, but starting a new monastery from the beginning is always a lot of work and a lot of hardship. Especially if you have monks, nuns and lay people in one property because we all like staying in the motel in different blocks. So when you have lay people, monks, nuns and lay people staying all together, it can be really out, out of control sometimes. <laughs> but luckily, uh, last two years, the monks monastery was built, so the monks move over and have their own, own, own monastery. And um, yeah, and after that, when that happened, everything become more, more stable because the monks and nuns don't have to interact too much. So the, the monks have their own quiet place <clears throat> to practice and to run the place, and the nuns have their own place. And, but this year, we are building a, um, a retreat center, and it will be the next jhana grove. So we have one jhana grove here, and one jhana grove in, um, in, in Newbury Buddhist Monastery in Victoria. So we, we will have two retreat centers. So that will be exciting. So in the future, we, um, we the, give more opportunity for lay people to come and, and practice there. Yep, and there will be more um, more retreats running. Yeah, not all, not. I mean, this the retreats here are pre pretty full most of the time. You see, within one or five minutes, is fully booked. Yeah. So in the future, we have two retreat centers. Yeah. So that will give more opportunity opportunity for people to um, attend more retreats. Yeah. yeah, and I think once um, the retreat center is built in um, Victoria, yeah, that will be one of the best retreat center in um, in Australia. Yeah because it will be built to a very high standard where the, the walls, the ceilings uh, will, will be well insulated. Uh, it will be nice and quiet and there's floor heating. Uh. But in Newbury Buddhist Monastery, uh, in winter we get snow there, uh, about up to maybe two inches of snow. Uh. So the monastery is built to the high standard uh, where it's nice and quiet and also um, quite warm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you look, you oh, go. Thank you. thank you very much. You, you're welcome. If you Google uh, Newbury Buddhist, Buddhist Monastery, you, you see our website there.